Hello everyone. I hope this message finds you safe and sound wherever you are. My name is Nicholas and I am honored and humbled to be speaking to you today. First, congratulations to my fellow graduates and sincere gratitude to all of you who've helped us reach this point. If you had told me two years or even two months ago that this experience would end with me making a Fletcher commencement edition of the Queen's Christmas Address, sporting a homemade haircut and using my bedroom as a recording studio, I would have guessed you'd been overserved at social hour or maybe concussed by a crowd surfer at the latest Los Flecheros concert. But despite all disbelief, here we are doing our best to stick together, although we have to be apart. If you've been feeling as I have, you might be struggling to contain multitudes of competing and contradictory emotional states all at once. Any given day brings confusion about what's going on, anxiety about the future, grief for the lives and livelihoods that have been lost, sadness for what could have been but no longer can be, and outrage over what should be done but hasn't been. This takes place above the undercurrents of unremarkable routine and the morbid relief that reminds us unhelpfully, well, it could always be worse. But there's also a sense of determination and the hope that things will get better, if not soon, then eventually, alongside abiding admiration and appreciation for those who help, who take risks to take care of others. In trying to sort through all this discordance echoing between gratitude and grievance, I kept coming back to three practices that helped me stay grounded, and I offer them to you today in the hopes that you might find them helpful too. They are imagination, empathy, and joy. Joy in the face of crisis or tragedy is a radical act, but one that can sustain us in situations that might otherwise extinguish our spirits, like humor at a funeral, dancing at a demonstration, or singing in the lifeboats. Joy is often most necessary in the very moments in which it seems entirely out of place. However, I find there's, also, there's often a pressure to forebode our joy, to treat it like a scarce and finite resource that should be rationed, or something inappropriate to allow ourselves when suffering continues within and around us. I find, though, that foreboding joy doesn't actually mitigate or forestall suffering. It simply seeds it more ground to occupy in our lives. And so I would propose on a day like today that we create some safe harbor for joyful celebration, however strange that might seem. And in doing so, remind ourselves that joy can travel far and be resilient, but it doesn't fare well in isolation, as I suspect we're all already acutely aware. Rather, it is in community and belonging that we can multiply joy and divide suffering. Forging community through bonds that bridge difference and now distance requires empathy, the ability to identify with others that we perceive to be unlike ourselves. Black feminists teach us that tolerance for the suffering of others is a direct function of a lack of empathy stemming from privileged ignorance. In the countless case studies, conflict analyses, and evaluations that a Fletcher education entails, we've seen for ourselves how the harmful effects of crisis erupt along established fault lines in our societies, making some more vulnerable than others. If we were on campus in Medford, we wouldn't have to look further than a few miles, or kilometers if you prefer, to find examples of these fault lines. For example, the discrepancy of 30 years in life expectancy between Brookline and Roxbury, or pandemic infection rates seven times higher in Chelsea than in Cambridge. If we stifle our empathy and pretend these realities don't exist, we deny the suffering of others in ways that make us complicit in the reification of their oppression and exploitation. Instead, my hope for us is that we can cultivate and hone our empathy together, speaking in solidarity and acting with accountability. As we go about doing that, the words we choose and the people we cite matter. 
much as black and brown lives matter, queer and trans lives matter, and Muslim and Jewish lives matter, to name but a few. Above all, human rights and human dignity matter, but the work we do to make these statements self-evident, that matters too. That work is beyond what any of us can achieve on our own, and so as we cultivate empathy for one another, we should cultivate empathy for ourselves as well, finding self-compassion enough to say, I will do what I can with what I have, but inevitably, when it falls short, I will keep trying. That kind of empathy takes, in turn, imagination. In queer activism, there is a tradition of channeling imagination into reimagining futures, which I find to be the only antidote against inevitability. Accepting something as inevitable forfeits both our agency and our responsibility to affect change. When we aren't able to reimagine crises into opportunities, when we miss an opening for the cataclysm that creates it, we play a silent role in allowing disasters to go unnecessarily unmitigated. Instead, we should use our imagination to ask insistent questions, infused with empathy and inspired by joy. What would it take to live in a world in which we all belong? What would it take to get us there? If it doesn't exist, how can we create it? And as we do that, how do we ensure that no one gets left behind? We owe it to each other not to abandon our imagination and to succumb to despair or worse, to complacency. Doing so would discount the debt, sweat, and tears that we've all poured into this collective Fletcher endeavor of bettering ourselves so that we may better the world. We've all been told that it gets better and also never to use the passive voice when writing a memo. But I think it gets better when we make it better by using our empathy and our imagination to posit better as a destination towards which we can make progress, using the constellation of our shared joy as a guide when the going gets dark. I recognize this is far from a fitting end to our time together, but I maintain faith in our collective ability to make it a worthwhile start to something new. The seas may be rising, but so are we. The sky may be falling, but I say, let it shatter all our glass ceilings on its way down. Back to normal is impossible, so let's imagine a way forward together. And on that path, I wish you safety and strength every step of the way. And I'll be here if you need me. In fact, once it's safe to be in shared spaces again, you can probably find me right where you left me, back in Ginn Library. So don't be a stranger. In the meantime, stay well, congratulations, and thanks again. And now, over to Olivia. Thank you, Nicholas, for your timely and powerful words. I feel lucky to share a virtual stage with you, and I'm privileged to count you as a friend and a colleague. Thank you all for granting me the honor of being one of your commencement speakers. I hope you enjoy my carefully staged bookshelf as much as I enjoyed putting it together. As an opinionated graduate student, a captive audience is a heady experience, and I want to use this time to discuss two themes, two challenges for graduates, certainty and cynicism. Certainty about our place in the world, about the best way forward for all of us, about our relationships with others, is comfortable. It reassures us that we know everything that we need to know and that there's nothing left to learn. It's comfortable, but it's not productive. Let's do something much harder and more transformative. Confront the impulse to seek the comfort of certainty. Negotiate with it. Leave room to grow. This is important. All of you are going to have a hand in shaping the future. I mean, that's why you took out all those loans, right? So the future is in part dependent on your ability to be creative, to go beyond what you personally think, to listen to new voices, to shake up paradigms and challenge the order of things. Do not wear your certainty like blinders and claim to see. Hunt for different perspectives. Question what you find. Turn things inside out. The world depends on it. 
Cynicism is an easy companion to certainty, a bad habit, a way to fend off disappointment. It's easy to wear, easy to turn to, as easy as looking outside at the rain in Medford in late April, scoffing, well, isn't that typical? It's easy to succumb to. You all spend every day battered by stories of conflict and hardship, theories to explain why the world is this way, and horror stories from every corner of the world. Some of us have even experienced conflict in the halls of this institution, in interactions with other students, professors, and school administration. It's no wonder that cynicism becomes a reflex. But here's the call out. None of you are actually cynics. You haven't fooled me. What kind of cynic would go to graduate school to learn about how to improve the international system? What kind of cynic would immerse themselves in learning about all this bad and how we might make it better? What kind of cynic works to make an institution better than how they found it? A cynic wouldn't bother to take this opportunity to grow, to be uncomfortable, to challenge norms. So rid yourself of this fake notion that you're actually a cynic, stop laughing through your nose and muttering under your breath. Lean into your desire to create change, whether that looks like changing your local community or changing the world. Hold on to that spirit and don't let anyone dampen it, especially not yourself. After two years in these halls, I'm confident that I have found a good many of the people set to change the next decades. Your dedication, humor, and complexity have made Fletcher a home. Times are strange and the future is uncertain, but the people at this graduation have become some of my best friends, my future colleagues, the people I look up to, and the folks I'll watch on the news someday. Thank you for all that you have done and all that you are about to do. Thank you to the professors who have challenged us, opened doors, and listened. Thank you to the staff who run the whole thing, even and especially when we don't see it. Thank you to the families and found families who have supported every single graduate here today. And thank you particularly to my friends and family who have been by my side every step of the way. Class of 2020, I cannot wait to see what you will accomplish. Stay well, wherever you may be, and thank you.